If you would and want to follow along, please turn to the fourth chapter of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read, start reading in verse 8. And I put that in my notes wrong. That's what ink pens are for. Fix your notes. Philippians chapter 4 beginning in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned, and received, and heard, and seen in me, do. And the, Lord, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now in the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, I have learned, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound, Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding ye, notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. And I'm going to stop right there. Uh, last week Walter said something about being discontented which is something I know something about uh, I had heard Henry preach from this just a week or so before a few days before and when he said that about being discontented. Well, the opposite of discontent is to be content. And that's the title of this one. Learn to be content. Learn to be content. Now, I can tell you one thing for sure. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, he does not mince words. Paul, the apostle doesn't tiptoe around any subject. The gospel in our reception of it, the gospel in our belief of it, and the gospel in the world's rejection of it. Paul, whenever he is writing, goes full bore, plain truth, and with scriptural references about us and about others. And another thing I want to tell you, because this is going to be a repetition. Paul wasn't scared to repeat himself. Back up one chapter, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous. It's not, what, it's not tiresome. To preach the same thing, we've only got one message, folks. To preach the same thing unto you is, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it's safe. And you look at that word, it's good. It's good to be reminded. It's good that Paul repeated himself. There's no way you can preach the gospel without preaching Christ somewhere. And that's every time we preach, we are to preach Christ. We're not to preach man. We're to preach about man. We're to preach about men. Save men and lost men. All sinners. All in need of the grace of God. 
But how do you not repeat yourself? And besides that, it's good for you. We forget. We forget. See, the problem's not with the scriptures. The problem is with us, as always. And the thing I really like about this, he says, for me to, to write the same things to you is not grievous, but for you it's safe. What's the next thing he says there? Beware, dogs. <laughs> Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Why? For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So what do you need to know about dogs, evil workers, and the concision? Well, they don't worship God in the spirit. They don't rejoice in Christ Jesus. And they've got confidence in their flesh. Paul just lays it out. Mm. Here's what Paul always laid out in every one of his epistles, in every letter he wrote. Christ is all. From beginning to end, from Alpha to Omega, Christ is all. We only have one gospel, and that gospel is Christ is all. Because here's some questions. Where's our life? Our life is in Christ, hid in Christ. It's in God. It's hid in Christ. Where's our food, our sustenance? In the bread of life. In Christ. Where's our being? Ooh, we live, we move, and we have our being in Christ Jesus. Where's our salvation? It's in Christ. In his finished work. In his continuous and perfect intercession, intercession for us. Where's our treasure in Christ and where's our love? It's to be in Christ. Paul lays it all out. He repeats as necessary and he repeats as desired. And here's the thing. Paul here, this is a prison epistle. This was one that was written while he was in prison. You understand? Paul's in prison, let me say it, again. Again, this is not the first time Paul was in prison. We'll get into that a little bit later. And the funny thing is, one of the times he was in prison was in Philippi. That's how he got his start there. He and Silas were there in prison. They started praying and singing the praise of God. And the earth quaked. And all the doors opened and their bonds fell free because they were put in stocks in the cell. Because they told that jailer, don't you lose these boys. And guess what? The doors opened and the bonds fell away and the Philippian jailer was going to kill himself. And, Christ, and Paul hollered out, don't do it. We're still here. The doors open, the bonds are gone, but we're still here. There's a message there, I think. <laughs> but anyhow, one of the places that Paul had been in prison before was Philippi. And that's who sent him this gift. They sent him something. But here's Paul in prison in Philippi writing to encourage these people. Who sent him an offering. Who took up an offering and got it to him. In prison. And what's he doing? He's comforting them. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that something? He was concerned about the welfare, the condition, and the faith of these Philippians. And he writes to comfort them, to warn them, and to uplift them. That's an apostle. You understand? That's a preacher of the gospel. But here, what I want to talk about today is learning to be content. He goes on, he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, what are honest, things that are just, pure, whatsoever things are lovely, of good report. Good report. 
If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. What? These things, those things which ye have both learned. Learned. And received, and heard, and seen in me. Well, what are we supposed to do now? We well, do. Do. There's some walk, Mason. Do what? What? Pure, lovely, good report, virtue. What's that? Good. Good. Praise. Ah, that's the thing. Praise. Not each other. Praise God. Not another man. Not yourself. Praise Christ. Because guess what? Anything pure, anything lovely, anything of good report, anything of virtue comes from Christ. It doesn't come from me. It don't come from you. And that do. Praise Christ for what he's done. Uh, and the God of peace shall be with you. Because trust me, you're not going to do any of that unless the God of peace is with you. It's not going to happen. But here he did say, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care hath flourished again. Now listen, Paul wasn't telling these people they were late. Because here he says it, Now at last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. I looked it up. I like Google sometimes. You know how far it is from Philippi to Rome? It's about 1,300 miles. That's a lot of camels. That's a lot of walking. That's a pretty good sea journey across the Mediterranean. 1,300 miles. Now, I will warn you about Google. This is just for our amusement, okay? When I first put in distance from Philippi to Rome, it said 4,600 miles because it was looking at Philippi, West Virginia. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. But, you know, Google knows I'm in West Virginia, I guess. But I, uh, I don't know. I'm saying 4,600, that can't be right, you know? I mean, I knew it was a fur piece, but, you know, that's a bit ridiculous. No, but it was 1,300 miles with no planes, no trains, and no automobiles. You rode on donkeys, you rode on camels, you went in a caravan, you didn't go by yourself. And you went on foot. They sent an offering 1,300 miles. To the, this man was thankful for that. You understand? They lacked opportunity. You just don't do that at the drop of a hat. That's the whole thing. It's not that when he says, he's talking about, oh, well, you were careful, you didn't want to do it. No, no, they were full of care. They wanted to do it all along. Yes. Why? Because of their fellowship in the gospel. From the first day, unto what? Unto now. 1,300 miles later. That's some fellowship. That's some fellowship. To personally take something that someone needs 1,300 miles on a camel or a ship or whatever even in a car or on a plane. That's the fellowship in the gospel. And Paul was indeed thankful and glad that they got the opportunity. But then he says this word, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. The Philippians sent this stuff to Paul when they could, when it was possible. And Paul thanked God for them. Paul prayed for them. And Paul rejoiced in the Lord in them. Paul thanked God for their fellowship in the gospel. Paul was glad, joyous, really, that these Philippians loved Christ and the gospel enough to support him. Nobody else had. When he was in Thessalonica, the only one that supported him was the Philippines. Philippians, I want to say Philippines. The Philippians. You understand? Paul wrote it. I thank God for you 
every time I think of you. Like I said, they sent that support 1,300 miles. But Paul wrote this, not that I speak in respect of want. You understand, Paul did have needs. He was in prison. Whether he was bound, whether he was just under house arrest, some of them say that he was bound to a jailer, and he may have been for a while. I'm sure he was in transport. That's a, that's a common thing. You tie the criminal to you so he can't get away. U.S. Marshals do it today. But here's the thing. Paul did have needs, but that's not his point. You understand? Paul was not speaking that, oh my goodness, I was in such a desperate need and you guys saved my life. No, he's saying... Christ has saved my life. Christ is taking to me. And he's doing it through you right now. And that's a blessed thing. That's a blessed thing. You know, Paul wasn't telling them, well, your age just arrived in the nick of time. No. Whenever your age comes, I thank God for it. Paul was grateful for their prayers and their thoughts before the stuff ever got there. Mm. Not so in respect of want. How then? I already said it. He was thankful for their fellowship in the gospel. From the first day unto right now. In Rome. In prison. Uh, he was joyous in their labor for Christ. Whether he benefited or somebody else benefited. You understand? This was a proof of their faith. This was a good work that they did. Why? Well, let's see. Somewhere in Philippians, I think it tells you. He put on you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. You understand? Paul told him that too. Don't get glory. Don't try to take glory for something good you did. Because it's God that put it in you to do it. Both to will it and to do it. And to carry it 1,300 miles to me. Oh, my. I mean, I can understand somebody might get a little puffed up. I can do that over nothing. <laughs> Much less doing 1,300 miles to give somebody a gift that they really need. I mean, I can get puffed up, but, you know, well, I'm not going to talk about the food bank again this week. But, you know, I mean, it don't take much to puff me up. That's what i got to watch out for. But Paul's telling him, he says, listen, I thank God for you. And I thank God because he did it in you, the will and to do of his good pleasure. Mm, man. Paul was joyous in their labor. Their fellowship in the gospel, their love for Christ Jesus and his apostle. You understand? We need to support the men who preach the gospel. And I include myself in that. I'm not leaving myself out. The only way we can do that is for him to put in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. We can't take credit for that. You understand? We are to give. Yes, and I'm glad this place does give. It's, 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 it's great. We don't have to worry about money. I mean, we don't have a lot, but we got enough. And guess what? That's what God promised us. Was enough. Enough. Hmm. But their fellowship in the gospel, in their love for Christ Jesus, and their love for their apostle was a cause for rejoicing in the Lord. In the Lord. Why? Well, Paul tells us. Not that I speak in respect of one. For. That little word there. I have learned. Hmm. 
Man, that's four nice words there. For I have learned. I like to be able to say that. What got me was I heard Henry preaching about this. He just mentioned this in passing. He said, and think about it, okay? Just think about it. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. This man, who, when he was Saul of Tarsus, going to kill and imprison Christians. God met him on the road to Damascus, knocked him off his donkey, and made him a preacher of the gospel. This man, this man, <coughs> who was revealed Christ by Christ himself, audibly. He saw the light, and he heard the voice of him that spake to me. This man... He had to learn this. You understand? He had to learn how to be content. It ain't easy. It ain't easy. Oh, no. This apostle, so strong in faith, a man who saw Christ Jesus after his ascension, used by the Holy Spirit to write scripture, he was given many, what is it, abundant revelations. He had to learn how to be content. He had to learn it. Don't feel that. That makes me feel good. You understand? Because if Paul had to go through this, well, darn right, I'm going to have to too. And so are you. This is not a natural behavior of man to be content. Okay? The problem is me. I'm going to share. The problem is you. It's you. It's us. Understand, I know who's in charge. Wholeheartedly. You understand? I know who's sovereign. And it ain't me. You know? It's not you. It's Christ. But I know who's in charge. I know who's sovereign. I know by whom all things consist. I know it, I believe him, and I'm still affected by my circumstance. Wait a minute, in the negative. <laughs> you understand, I'm always, you know, the positive is so rare with me. I don't know if y'all are like this or not, but I'm always affected in the negative by my circumstance. You understand? <laughs> My abasement is always too low, and my abounding is never high enough. Have you ever felt that way? Now, true, I have a lot less experience with abounding than I do with abasement. I have a nice basement, you know. But here's the thing. I have more than I deserve. A lot more. And I do enjoy some of the things I have. And sometimes I'm scared somebody's going to try and take them away from me. If they do, I'm supposed to say, praise God. Think about Job. What happened, you know? If that, what happened to Job happened to me, I'd been whining like a little dog, scared of a thunderstorm. I'd be crying. What did Job do? He worshiped God. You know how he could do that? Because God put in both the will and the do of his good pleasure. And if he puts you through that, he's going to find a way to make you praise his name. You may not like it, what's happening, but you're going to praise his name. Because he does everything for his honor and his glory, whether it happens to you or somebody else. Being content in whatever state I am is not natural to man. Because I can tell you this one thing, and I believe it's also true of every one of you. Nobody ever had to teach me how to be discontented. <laughs> you understand? Nobody had to teach me how to be dissatisfied. I come by that honest. 
You understand? Because here's the thing. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's a fact. Well, here's what that fact also means. In my flesh dwells no contentment with my lot. Because nobody, I'm going to tell you this right now. I know a lot of people say, well, I got what I deserve. But they always secretly think they deserve a little better. You know, because this guy over here, he's worse than I am. He's got more money. He got a newer car. It's got air conditioning and it talks to you now. For me, that's a good reason to throw a car away, but that's okay. You understand? That's the way we are. No matter where we are. Well, here, I've said that a while back. No matter what you think of yourself, you're thinking too high. No matter how much you think you've abased yourself, and you think you deserve to be abased, you're thinking too high. Because if you're not thinking, you need to be dead. And in hell, you don't know your sin. That's where we all deserve to be. In my flesh dwells no contentment. Because we, all of us, you included, me included, everyone included, we need to learn how to be content Paul learned he said I have learned and you understand he said that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit Amen. he wasn't making this up folks he said I've learned well I can tell you let me tell you a couple negatives first before we get started into the positives Paul did not learn this from his parents he didn't learn it naturally he did not learn whatsoever state I am in to be content from his parents. He did not learn this at the feet of Gamaliel. You understand? Because he talks about what he learned in some places. And guess what he learned? He learned where to be puffed up. If any man got anything to boast in, I'm more. You understand? Paul didn't make that part up either. That was in him before. He was a Pharisee. What did he say? And, and now he does say, I speak as a fool now. He, he goes on and he says, let me boast. You, people got something to boast about, let me boast. I was a Hebrew of Hebrew, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now I was a Pharisee. And as concerning the law, a Pharisee. And as concerning the law, blameless. You couldn't point your finger at Paul and say, he, you know, Paul wasn't saying he kept the law fully, no. He was just saying people couldn't blame him for not keeping the law. Why? Because they never caught him. Because here's the one thing for sure he found out. He's up here. When the law said thou shalt not covet, that slew him. You understand? Because that's not something you're doing, although it is, but it's something you're doing up in your head, whether you act on it or not. Oh, you know where that comes from? I deserve better. I deserve better. My bounding ain't enough yet. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. It's a, it's a, it's will get all over you. But here, Paul had to learn this, and so do we. Uh, but that's not where he learned it. I'm going to tell you where Paul learned it. It's starting on the road to Damascus. Because what happened when Saul of Tarsus, what happened when he saw the light and he heard the voice, well, the first thing that happened to him, he said, who are you? <laughs> a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, concerning the law of blameless, and the Lord speaks to him from heaven. And this man says, who are you? You want to know why? He didn't know. And the world doesn't know now. Not this Jesus. <laughs> Not this Christ, not this Lord, this Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, and what else happened? He was blinded. He was blinded. And you know what happened then? He had to be led the rest of the way to Damascus. He ended up in Damascus anyway. But guess what? He got a new purpose now. 
He's got a new purpose. But there was no way for him to get to Damascus unless somebody led him there. And you know what happens? Oh, Saul had to be led the rest of the way by the hand. There's a sermon there. Because there he is in a city blind. Because I'm going to tell you right now, Saul of Tarsus, now Paul the Apostle, is being led right here by our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are being led by Christ. Whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, I hope to God you'll see it after a while. Because sometimes it takes a while to say, well, that's what that was about. That back there was to get me here. How come I didn't see that to start with? Well, we're... You know, we're discontented. We're not looking. And when we're looking, we're not seeing. That's what I say. The problem is us. The problem is me. But Paul is still being led here in Rome by Jesus Christ. What's it, what, what did he write to the Romans? All things work together for good. To them that love God. To them that are the called according to his purpose. Uh, Paul tells some of his experience. And Paul, uh, Paul here, you read part of this. I want to tell you something. This is how Paul learned. How to be content. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 beginning in verse 23 are they ministers of Christ I speak as a fool I am more why in labors more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths oft of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen. And in perils of heathen. You understand? When you're a Christian, when you're a believer... You can't win. God's going to put you through the ringer. Now your ringer is probably not going to be like this. And thank God for that also. Because we have his words for an end sample. You know, I understand Earl used to say it. You know, the burned hand teaches best. And better felt than tell was what, you know, they used to tell me. I personally tried to prescribe, uh, you know, subscribe to the adage of this. Learn from the mistakes of others. You don't have time to make them all yourself. You understand? This is written for our warning and our admonition and all this. Please learn from the Apostle Paul. In my own countrymen, in perils by heathen, in perils in the city, and in perils in the country, uh, the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And then he goes into his physical problems. And weariness, painfulness, watchings often, and hunger and thirst, fastings often, and cold and nakedness. Besides those things, beside all that, the daily care of the church. That's the thing that was on him daily. You understand? We think we have it bad sometimes. And I'm guilty of this. I don't know what bad is. Not this way. I don't want to. I really don't. I want to be content not to know this in this way. I want to know it. I want to learn it. And I want to grasp it. But please, I don't really want to go through this. Let's go through it here. In our heads and in our minds and our thoughts and our prayers. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern... 
mine infirmities. We apologize for our infirmities. Christ said, I'm a, uh, Paul said, I'm going to glory in Christ in my infirmities. And that's what you read this morning, Paul. Because here, here's a specific concern. He says, it was given to me. Now, who gave this to Paul? Christ did. Christ did. Amen. Who gave it? A thorn in the flesh. Now, you understand, Christ gave him eternal life. Christ gave him light, and then he took his sight for a while, gave it back to him later on, and sent him out to preach. Gave him the message to preach. Abundance of revelations. That's what he's going to say here. You understand? He did all that. And yet, he's also the same one that gave him the thorn in the flesh. What did Job say? If we take good things from God's hands, we're not going to take something else? You are. You may not want to, but you are. Because that's what he does. Ah. What did he say? For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, No. And I've got, you know, in my Bible program, I got the words of Christ in red on the, it comes up on the, the program. And it's the words of Christ. He said unto me, my grace is present tense. My grace always is. It always was, it always is, and it always will be sufficient for thee. God's grace is always specific. It's sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. You understand? To much is given, to whom much is given, much is required. You no. Know, I might be exalted above measure. What? He gave me a thorn in the flesh, lest I be exalted above measure. Why? Through the abundance of the revelations. Paul was given a lot. Yes, he was. By Christ. <laughs> you read it earlier, you know. I knew a man, whether it's in the body, out of the body, I don't know. Why? It don't matter. Because he heard things that was unspeakable. Now it's not unspeakable because it's bad. It's unspeakable because you can't speak of it. Paul had all this in his, in his head at one time because he wrote it down. Now did he keep everything in there all at one time? I don't think so. Because I figure he's just like us. He forgets stuff. But that's why you write some stuff down. And when the Holy Spirit's <laughs> having you write something down, it's the truth of God. But he had a thorn in the flesh. And I'm going to tell you this. After reading 2 Corinthians 11, after reading 2 Corinthians 12, the prosperity gospel can bite me. Because it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. I'll say it on television if this makes it there. We're close. Because you understand, you want to come tell me the, the reason Paul went through all this stuff was his faith wasn't very strong. I'm going to laugh you out to, you, you, you know the expression of laughing to scorn? That's what's going to happen. Because you're going to tell me that, I'm going to tell you you're an idiot. Because this is the man blessed of God with a thorn in the flesh. You understand? You can't read, can't read that, the, sing this song. God has not promised skies always blue, flower strewn pathway all our lives through. God has not promised sun without rain, peace without sorrow, and joy without pain. But God has promised strength as our day. I'm going to tell you something. That's the day you're in right now. <laughs> you know? And tomorrow, when it's today, that'll be that day. It'll be this day. That's right. ah, rest when we labor and light on the way. Grace for our trials. Mm -hmm. 
I like this song. I do. I wish there were more verses. Help from above, unfading kindness, and undying love. Yeah. Sing that at Creflo Money Sermons. I don't think they will. And I'm going to tell you something. They don't know anything about the gospel. They don't know anything about Christ. And they sure don't know anything about the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul learned by the example, by the teaching. You can't learn unless you're taught. And through all this, what did he say? I was answered. My grace is sufficient for thee. Now that goes for the thorn in the flesh as well as being stoned, being shipwrecked, being <laughs> beaten with a rod, <laughs> whipped 39 times, 40 minus 1, <sighs> in perils with mine own countrymen. Your own family will be against you. And in perils of the heathen, because the heathen will be against you. Here's the thing about a child of God. Nobody likes you. You understand? Nobody likes you except Christ. And he's the only one that matters. You know? And the only reason I like you is because you're in Christ. Because we can fellowship in his gospel. We fellowship in him. And we fellowship in his gospel. So I've learned what whatsoever, whatsoever state I am to be content. Because Paul learned because he was taught that his circumstances do not determine your contentment with Christ. That's where the point is. And I'm going to tell you something. That's a good walk. That's a good walk. I mean, it's a hard thing to preach walk when you're preaching grace. Not really if you do it right. <laughs> there, there, there is no grace without a good walk. You know why? Because he'll see to it. And he will teach you. And when he teaches you, no matter what I say, you'll learn. You'll learn. You'll learn in spite of me. You know? And you know what? There and I'll rejoice. I got no ego in this. I know it's not me. I can't do this without him. And you ain't got nothing to hear. Unless he's giving you ears. Circumcised heart and ears. Because mm. all we got. All we have. Until he comes to you. Is unbelief. And discontentment. Paul learned whatsoever state I am. To be content. Because whatever state you're in, never forget this. Never forget this. If you don't get anything else, get this. Wherever you go, there you are. And wherever you are, there is Christ. In you, the hope of glory. It's not you. It's him. It's always him. And he says, I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. You understand that? The implication being I know how to be content, abased and abounding, or and any combination of the two. Because you can be abased in your spirit and abound in money. You can be abased in your monetary financial standings. And you can abound in your health. You understand? It doesn't matter. If you know Christ. Amen. Be content. Because a base or a bound. Jesus Christ is the same. A base or a bound. Jesus Christ is the source. A base or a bound. He is with you. Because his spirit. The Holy Spirit. Is in you. A base or a bound. Jesus Christ knows our infirmity. A base or a bound, he's our intercessor. With the Father. With the Father. 
A base or a bound, he's our life. A base or a bound, he knows our circumstances better than we do. Because know this. Knowing him makes everything better. It's that simple. You understand? If you know Christ, if you trust Christ, if you've submitted to Christ, ah, Oh, you might get there. Uh, some people don't like the submission part. It's tough. Because that's what he says. And that's what it teaches. And that's what we need to learn. You understand? If, if we're submitted to him, whether it's whatever state we are in, we'll be content. You understand? Because, see, your discontentment is a state of not being in submission to Christ. That's where it is. Now, it's in us. It's in my flesh. And there's that war. That's part of the war. Part of the war is the fact that my flesh don't like Christ. Ha! People don't want to talk about that. And, yes, that is the battle of a Christian, not an unbeliever. Because if you're an unbeliever, all you got is unbelief. And Walter and I were talking about this on the phone yesterday, what Tim James said. Listen, unbelief is not a lack of belief. Unbelief is a lot of wrong beliefs. That's what it is. That you're wrong. And trust me, unbelief's still in you. Just like it's still, Lord, help thou my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. Because that's still here too. Conclusion, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, you want the opposite of that? You can't do nothing without Christ strengthening you. That I'm more used to than knowing I can do all things. You understand? This, this is the thing. We, <laughs> we're better at the negative than we are the positive, Walter. But I can do all things through Christ with strength. Why? He told them. He'll put it in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What? He told these Philippians? Thank you for your fellowship in the gospel. And I thank God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until right now. With every one of my infirmities, Paul wrote, I believe God. And if you believe Christ, here's the thing. Walter and I talked about this yesterday. Whatever this book says, whatever Christ has said, you believe. I didn't say you understand. I didn't say agree with. But if he said it, it's settled. You understand? I got nowhere else to go. And I have, even more importantly, I have no one else to go to. Or to whom to go. Whatever the good English is of that. I have learned. I'm better at it. I, I must admit, Walter, I used to be pitiful. But I've learned... To be mostly content. <laughs> Whatever state I'm in. And I'm going to tell you one of the things that really helps. Is being able to come here. And be encouraged by you people. And be around you. You understand? It's good. To be in the fellowship of the gospel. It's good to be here. I say that about every week. But it's only because I mean it. I mean, I could smile and lie, but that's you know what other people do at my job. <laughs> I am glad to be here. And it's good for me to be here. It's good to gather together. I'm looking forward to the meeting. Well, see, because I get a day off, you know, on Sunday. I get to come listen to somebody else preach. That's good. Yeah. It is. There are others around with whom we have a fellowship in the gospel. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time. 
Lord, help us, teach us to be content in your son. Because that's where all the treasure lies. Be with Walter as he comes to preach the gospel. Thank you. In his name, amen.